Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another night shift. Tonight we're gonna focus on making steel textures, flame cuts and weld beads. I've already made two separate videos about these techniques in the past, but some things have changed since then and also the old videos are kinda unwatchable. So consider this an update and the ultimate guide. So. My friends, first of all, we should have the main components of our tank such as the hull and turret glued together. Even modern kits with nice details can have some fitting issues, leaving visible seam lines, or the details are just meh. Or sometimes the parts don't fit at all and we have to fill and sand these places, often ruining the details. Or the interlocking plates don't line up like at all. <laughs> So in the past I advised to use a Tamiya scribing tool and a straight edge, but I found something much better. These super cheap scribing chisels from eBay were only like 20 bucks, which is just slightly more than the Tamiya scriber, and they come in different sizes ranging from like 0.5 going up to 2 millimeters. Working with them is much easier and faster compared to the previous method, because we don't need to meticulously align a straight edge every time we're about to scribe something. With these, there's no need to use a ruler at all. The pre-existing weld lines are gonna guide the chisel on their own, thus making our life easier. Another advantage over the scriber is their shape. The scriber has a triangular profile, meaning the deeper you go, the wider the gap becomes. With chisels, no matter how deep you scribe, the line is gonna be just as wide as the chisel. Again, super thin like 0.5, all the way up to 2 millimeters. I don't think we as armor modelers are ever gonna need anything less or more for our models. And yeah, we can either drag the chisel towards us, which is better for the initial few passes, or we can just push it away from us, which will remove more material, but there's also a chance it'll slip and scratch the surrounding surface, so it's best to decide the technique depending on your circumstances. This method is very popular amongst Gundam modelers, and although their results are day and night compared to this, us armor modelers don't need pristine weld lines. Cleanup is fast and simple, just a few passes with a sanding stick to remove any burrs, and a pass of thin modeling glue such as Mr. Cement S, Tamiya Extra Thin or even Acetone will finish the job, giving them a nice, clean and sharp appearance. Also, it should go without saying that this is ideally performed as the very first step before adding any textures, because mistakes can happen, and it's easier to fill and sand a scratch surface before you start texturing it. Anyway, now we have the model ready for additional effects, and the next logical step is to add armor texture. This technique has also gone through some revisions of mine, and initially I only used diluted Tamiya putty to recreate the rough surface, but this time we're also gonna utilize modeling cement. Even though the bottle says Mr. Cement S, I have poured VMS glue inside, but don't worry, any thin modeling glue of your choice will work. We're also gonna need a large soft brush, but more importantly, a cheap, stiff bristle brush from a hardware store. In contrast with the old steel texture technique, the first step in this process is to brush the glue straight onto the model and then, once the plastic becomes softer, stipple it aggressively with the stiff bristle brush. And yeah, I mean aggressively, like stab, stab, stab. And then, once you have the small patch completely textured, repeat the process until the entire plate is done. Working times can vary depending on the type of glue you're using. For example, Mr. Summit S evaporates very quickly and the surface will be hard in about 10 minutes. While this VMS glue I'm using is much more aggressive, melts plastic faster, but it also takes longer to fully cure. It took a few minutes before I was even able to touch the surface without leaving a fingerprint in it, so make sure you're familiar with your preferred type of cement. 
The textured surface already looks really nice and we could use it as it is, but we'll take it a step further. In fact, it'll be the same procedure like with the old method, which involves diluting Tamiya modeling putty with the same modeling cement and it should be about this thick. Basically to a point where it barely covers the plastic. You know, what I mean is the original plastic should be barely showing through. This method serves multiple purposes. It fills some of the previously created pits, making the effect more random and subtle, but also creating more texture in form of randomly shaped and raised um, flakes. <laughs> you know, exactly how it happens in real life. Here's actually a good idea to use the old cousin Google and look up some close-up museum photos of the tank you're building. Sometimes the steel texture can be clearly seen in historical black and white pictures as well, but obviously a high resolution close-up shot from a museum is gonna be more helpful. You can of course use other types of modeling putties, and I'm pretty sure Mr. Dissolve putty from Gunze is gonna work perfectly, but I haven't tried it myself, but theoretically it should have the same consistency as our homemade beverage. Cast steel surfaces are a little more specific because their texture can range from almost completely smooth to extremely gnarly depending on the manufacturing process, the subsequent machining of the cast pieces and also when the part was made. For example, late war tanks are notoriously rough. But most of the time a universal cast texture can look very similar to rolled steel. You know, a bit more pronounced, especially on German armor, because Germans didn't have the industry to cast very large pieces. And these small parts were usually rather smooth when compared to, let's say, Soviet Ice 2 turrets. And yeah, fun fact, this entire Yak Tiger armor plate was a steel casting. The more you know. So now it's time to smooth out the texture with this super fine sanding sponge, which is... I think something like 2000 grit sandpaper. Before I proceeded though, I left the texture overnight so it was completely dry. And then the next day I just very gently sanded or polished it. I was putting almost no pressure on the sponge. In fact, I was pretty much just holding it in place with my finger and just letting it slide across the surface. It's really just to even out the most protruding imperfections. And again, this will depend on the tank you're building. Now we have all the armor plates and cast pieces textured, but not entirely, because we still need to add flame cuts to their cross sections. I was recommending a simple hobby knife for this task before, but actually a razor saw and a squared shaped needle file are much more efficient. Not only is the process much faster, thus less boring, but also the results are more irregular and thus more natural looking. Again, the amount of flame cut texture depends greatly on the model you're building and for example a Tiger 1, which was built earlier in the war, had some armor plates machined, resulting in no visible flame cuts. A Yak Tiger is a late war production and yeah, it really shows. Because, you know, it just had to be finished and functional. There was no time to make it look, you know, showroom ready. <laughs> Again, looking at close-up museum photos is a great help because you can often find very interesting details that will add a ton of character to your model. And thus it will set it apart from others in your display case or on the model show table if that's your thing. Web pages like Prime Portal or Net Maquettes are great sources of these photos, but again, don't be afraid or lazy to use Uncle Google as well. In fact, I think flame cuts add the most character to any tank model and they just make it look more heavy and menacing. Again, it's best to perform this step in the earliest stages of your build. As you can see, there are pretty much no details glued on this model because they just get in my way and there would be a very high chance I'd damage something. Overall, this technique is very similar to the old one, so, you know, add flame cuts and then soften them with modeling cement. 
just the tools are different and the whole thing is easier and more time efficient. The model is now completely textured, in some places it's really gnarly and I can't wait to put some paint and enamel washes on these parts. And in fact I also glued a few details in place because the next step is welding. Most of the stuff in this chapter is gonna be the same, so you know, same body, same methods. It's just gonna be more watchable than my old video and there are also gonna be some new texturing tools. So again, Tami Epoxy Body Quick Type is in my opinion the best modeling epoxy ever, so I highly recommend it. And just as before, it's important to roll it between two styrene or cardboard sheets with the aid of some tap water, which will prevent it from sticking to them. The thickness of these putty noodles depends on how fat the weld bead is supposed to be, and I'd recommend practicing this technique on a heavy vehicle like this Yakta Egger, which has some serious welds. The best way to get some nice, in scale looking welds which are not oversized or spilling out of the weld line is to use the scribed groove as your guide and just fill it completely. Make sure the putty touches the edges, there are no gaps and it isn't bulging out above the surface because texturing will make it stand out even more. If there's too much putty just slice it off with a hobby blade which will make it level with the surface and then continue squeezing it in real tight. There's more useful information in the first tutorial video, so I'm gonna leave links to both uh, steel texture and welding video in the description below, and one of them is on the screen as well. A common issue people have is the putty not sticking to the surface. Tami epoxy is extremely sticky, like a chewing gum, so you just have to make sure it's not soaking in water when you're applying it to your model. Also worth keeping in mind is the working time of the putty before it gets too hard to work with. I usually spend about half an hour applying it to the model and then I start texturing. This task requires several tools, all of which are custom made for a specific purpose. You'll find more information on how to make them in one of my Tiger 1 videos, Again, you'll find the link in the description below, but between us, a hobby blade can be also used, but of course the amount of different welding patterns you can create with it is gonna be quite limited. As in almost any case, reference photos are a good start, because you can find lots of specific weld patterns on your tank. For example, Yak Tiger has these C-shaped weld beads when the weld line was vertical, and then they turn to multiple pass welds once the line becomes more horizontal. I'm no welder, I'm just replicating what I see on the real thing, but I suppose the specific texture is given by the welder who was filling the weld with this horizontal motion, you know, always going left to right or right to left, but never up and down. This can also vary depending on the nationality of the tank, but most of the time you'll find only two types. The single bevel, which has this CCC shape, or it can be just lots of horizontal ridges. And a multiple pass weld, which has these numerous symmetrical lines following along the weld line. It's very important to have your texturing tool slightly moist with water, but beware, because too much water, which can easily collect in these C-shaped tools, can result in you tearing out the weld. Look, I'll be honest, I never use tap water. I just put it between my lips and give it a, you know, give it a very tender peck with the tip of my tongue. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know, it's not hygienic and most of you are gonna give me a piece of your mind in the comment section, but hey, I'm just being real with you. It just works. And honestly, I think that's all I wanted to say about it. I think the results are totally worth the effort and look much better than the original ones, even though some of these modern kits have very nice welds, but let's be honest, handiwork always has the extra value, and all these tiny barely noticeable imperfections in the weld texture, they're hard to replicate when you're digitally sculpting a model. So I hope you found this guide helpful or at least interesting to watch. Uh, I wanted to make an updated version of those old tutorials I made last year because 
I just can't stand watching them. But still, I think the best way to gain as much information as you can is to watch them as well. This video covers all the techniques in one package, so I hope it was worth your time. Anyway, thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you liked what you saw, leave a like and subscribe if you're new here and don't want to miss out all the other content coming your way. And of course, a big hug and thank you to my generous patrons who make this weekly show possible. If you want to see all the exclusive content about this Yak Tiger and all my other models, then don't be shy and give my Patreon page a look. You might find one of the rewards interesting and in return, every pledge goes a very long way. There's stuff like almost daily photo updates from my workbench, one week early ad free videos, super mega large HD photos like the ones playing in the background and also DMs so we can get in touch. Anyway, that's all I have my friends, so I hope you're gonna have a fantastic weekend or day or evening depending on when you're watching this. Leave a like if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, make sure to subscribe because a lot of people watching my videos are not subscribed, and I'll catch you my friends in the next one, cheers!